Welcome everybody to this webinar. It is a delight um, for all of you to be here. And before we start, we're more, we're more with the official part. It's a great honor. Um, Chief Brother Phil, if you could start with a prayer and then I'll introduce everybody here. Okay. Wakantanka, creator of the universe, most beloved one, all powerful one, most kind one, most compassionate one, ever forgiving one. We call upon your holy power at this time that we might awaken to the reality that we have passed into runaway climate change and that we must awaken as with one heart and one mind and many bodies with the, 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 the unity of one human family, the understanding the hurt of one is hurt of all and begin to prepare what's before us. We ask and give respect to all that have joined us today from the east from where comes the red sunrise to the south from where high noon is to the west from where comes darkness and thunder lightning and rain and to the north from where comes the white snow and father sky mother earth and well the sacred beings that we are sovereignty is ancient and perishable and everlasting and just give thanksgiving for all the work that went in and alludes to organizing this and give thanksgiving to each and every one of the elites who are joining us now. Today we are with amazing people, um, everybody. Uh, my name is Andalou Smitsman. I am the founder and CEO of Earthfy Center. And I'd just like to just give a very brief introduction for all of our panelists and other, you know, wonderful um, support and team who is here um so and you know the setting for today of course is for us to really talk come together and talk about how can we best respond to this agrogenocide and we'll briefly go into what that means runaway climate change really unite our actions unite our hearts unite our consciousness and uh, you know i really stand for the future generations and our planetary health so let me start by just presencing who's with us here today. And we are really delighted and honored um, of so many more, more amazing people. You know, we're all joining their voices and their wisdom. So first of all, hereditary um, Chief Phil Lane, who has given us permission to call him Brother Phil <laughs> for the rest of the webinar, um, who's the founder and CEO of Four Worlds International Institute and also chairperson of the Compassion Game International, member of the Evolutionary Leaders Network, um, we're delighted as well that Rex Weiler, co-founder of Greenpeace International and published author, uh, is joining us as well. A little bit later uh, during the webinar, there will be uh, Lila June, which is really a great honor that she's uh, you know, said yes to come on board and at the last minute as well. So we are deeply grateful for her to be here as well. She's a very gifted musician and educator and anthropologist and public speaker and many more things. And, very powerful voice for the seventh generation as well and i was so grateful that connie baxter marlowe and andrew cameron bailey uh, who are incredible filmmakers and educators and authors and also many more things uh, are with us today as well and uh, my dear friend dr daniel christian wall who wrote his amazing book uh, designing regenerative cultures and he's a fantastic educator author also a member of the evolutionary leaders network uh, Michelle Holiday, I'm so delighted <laughs> that you also accepted our invitation. Um, she's also a public speaker and she's written amazing work uh, about really the spirit and the essence of what thrivability truly stands for. And also she writes a lot about stewardship. And Dr. Kurt Barnes as well, who's a psychosocial expert and therapist. So very happy that you're with us as well um, for today. And then there are more wonderful voices here who I like to presence of amazing people who we really would have liked to include in the panel, uh, yet due to some time constraints, we were not able to. And this is why I want to presence them. And you know, for all of you to please know that they are in every way part of all that we will be sharing today. And we really value their support. Alexander Laszlo, Asha Labering, Karen lindemann Boer. And uh, Shannon Lane, Pafel, Nashka, um, and um, Asha and Karen are also founding members of the Sacred Circle of the Indigenous Women of Europe, of which I'm also a part. And then, of course, and I would say this is probably the most important voice for us to presence, and that is Mother Earth. 
and our larger family of life of all our non-human relatives whose voices are so often not heard and um, and also are not honored so we really present them also in the circle today including our relatives of the animals and the insects and the plants and the trees and the stone relatives and many more so that really you know brings us the context and <laughs> invites us all into the circle <laughs> as well as our ancestors and the future generations why we are all here together and uh, why we are really all you know doing this and uh, and why this is such an important call for action. So just as very brief context, because there's a lot of people whose voices you'll be listening to. So the context is really um, runaway climate change, which you've probably heard of a lot in the news, but we'll be going deeper in details what that means and what we've called the ecogenocide, which is really you know the, the mass extinction, the mass killing of our biodiversity loss uh, and so in short, what it really means, it is a huge wake up call for us to come together as a human family and to also change the way that we relate with each other, that we relate with our natural world and that we do whatever we can to safeguard our planetary health now and for the future generations long to come. So having said that, I would love to give the talking stick now to Brother Phil and if you could also introduce Rex and Lila that would be great. <laughs> Very uh, warm and loving greetings and embrace to each and every one of us who together are really one heart and one mind and many bodies in a certain way. Each of us a sovereignty, ancient and imperishable and everlasting. Each of us a spiritual representative of all that have gone before us since the beginning of time. And I would really appreciate, uh, Sister Annalise, if you could briefly define for everyone uh, what we're talking about when we talk about what is runaway climate change and echo genocide. Could you please just speak a little bit in that definition so we clear on what we're speaking about? Yes, my pleasure. Um, let me share with you some graphics that will make that very, very clear. So the first of all, what's important is when we're talking about runaway, it's in the word already, runaway climate change, it means that there are escalating events in terms of ecosystem collapse. And it's like you, you probably know the domino effect when you line them all up and you take one and then it comes to the other and it just starts to roll over. Well, that's what's happening on our, when we're looking at our vital planetary health systems uh, that are essential um, for us as human beings, but also for all our other relatives as too as well. So if these ecosystems collapse, there's escalating effects. So here you see, for example, a graphic that explains very clearly what we are now in terms of our global warming. Um, we are here in dangerous territory. So this is from 2015, things are, my, are worse now. So we are already at around one degree warming pre-industrial levels. And then we can start to see escalating effects. So the higher the temperature goes, the more we get the more problems we're getting in terms of threatened ecosystems, extreme weather events, as many of you have already been seeing, dying off of coral, coastal flooding, um, and so much more. So what we want to really make sure is that we need to make sure it doesn't go beyond two degrees. Because past that, this is when this you know, runaway climate change starts to escalate. And currently, if we're looking at our emissions and our biodiversity loss and our eco footprint, which you'll see here, um, I'll try to show you that as well. We are already committed um, to two degrees and we are running now towards three to four degrees warming. So here, for example, we're seeing our ecological footprint trends. So what, that's, what this graphic shows is that we are eating up our planet and we're not giving our planet a chance to regenerate herself. So we're using and consuming many more resources than Mother Earth uh, can restore and and that puts all of us in danger yeah, here we see as well um, all of these greenhouse gas concentrations um, carbon methane uh, and nitrous oxide etc uh, increasing now methane is even more dangerous than carbon in terms of its heating impacts over time and what we need to understand as well is for example if we're going around 3.2 degrees warming and we are on that trajectory if we don't drastically change things, then all that methane that's in the ocean is going to become emitted and we can easily shoot over 
to four, five, even six degrees, in which case it becomes very, very difficult um, to sustain life. Here, what we are seeing in this graphic, there are nine critical boundaries, planetary boundaries, yes, and we'll be sharing all these resources with you later. And when you can see here, four of these ecosystemic boundaries we are already crossing. This is another way of looking at runaway climate change. Um, the ecogenocide is that we are starting to come to collapsing points that have escalating, carrying over impacts. Yeah? If we're looking at from a biodiversity perspective, then we see in the last 40 years, we have reduced our biodiversity with more than 50%. And that gives you just an overview of where we see that biodiversity loss. And it's very important to understand that for our planet, it's through the biodiversity that our planet learns, evolves, keeps itself healthy and resilient. Yeah? And I think as well, if the insects are going, and we've seen a lot of that, how can there also be cross-fertilization, for example? So there are so many escalating impacts, sometimes invisible to people or very subtle, which can have huge impacts across different time scales and spatial skills. Now, this very quickly as a graphic, this shows us how we are killing wildlife. Yeah? So this is all the space um, that we have given to cattle at the cost of so many other species. So these are just a few little graphics um, to just put things in perspective. Why it is so important um, that we <laughs> you know, change the way we live. And a lot of what you're seeing here in these graphics that is due to our economic system, unfortunately. So in the same way that we can see all these emissions that have escalated behind that, um, it's really we as people in the way that we have been uh, using fossil fuels, burning fossil fuels, and um, in order to um, you know, run our societies. So this is a call for a whole new way. Brother Phil. Uh, well, thank, thank you so much, sister, for doing that. <clears throat> you know, um, I've had the chance to, to travel with an international team down to the Amazon um, early in the past year. And to see what's going on there and other places in the world, and to realize that that I, and it, from my perspective, you know, and this is and this is really something that a dear brother uh, has been telling me for forty years from Greenland, and that is the big ice on Greenland is going to melt, and there's nothing at this point we can do about it. And it's become clear. I just was visiting with him, and again. This is going at a minimum to increase sea level by 15 feet. How, well, how many meters is that at a loose? And it gets uh, four, at least four meters. Yes, that's right. Four or five meters. Yeah. Four, four, four or five meters. And now this is going to set in motion. And as you saw in those, those diagrams, all kinds of things. We're talking about hundreds of millions of relatives of our human family who are, are right on the edge of this whole, uh, along the water, are going to be climate refugees, as many are today. We're talking about fires that we just saw hit California escalate in a major, major way everywhere. And we're seeing it here in Canada. It was something to be here in Vancouver while there was smoke, uh, you know, filling, filling you know, our streets from all the fires going on in the north part of Canada. And that's not going to slow down. I think what's so important for us to, to awaken to and realize is that as the prophecies promised, that until we understand fully that we are one human family and the herd of one is a herd of all, and we're related to all life. And then when we destroy the very foundations what, of which we need for life to go forward, we're destroying ourselves. And I want to share a story that was so poignant, I think, to this point. It was told to me over 40 years ago, but it still has the same kind of understanding and power that I believe we need to awaken to. And I, had a, I have a wonderful grandfather. His name is Vine Deloria Sr., who was really a great mentor of mine in my younger days, and told me stories that just, uh, you know, inspired my heart to this day. And one he told about uh, being home 
on the Standing Rock Indian Reservation in, in uh, South Dakota, a little community called Wakpala, South Dakota. And he was visiting with, with one elder who didn't speak English very well, but he, 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 he wanted to learn all the new English words. And of course, the word ecology has been around for a while, but really, uh, in my day, at least, um, and I'm not that old, 74, but even before that, that concept really wasn't used. I never heard the word. Until all of a sudden, towards the late 60s, early 70s, that word began to be used a little bit. Well, this elder was very sharp, and he heard this word. He didn't understand it. So he came to my, my um, uh, grandfather and said, you know, he said, uh, he was a cousin, he says, Tahashi, he said, what is this word these washichus are using um, um, this whole thing, ecology, trying to understand that. And so uh, as best he could, and he, he tried to describe to uh, this beloved elder cousin of his uh, what was happening in terms of, of, of why ecology began to be mentioned and so forth. He said, well, he said, you know, Tahashi he said, they have these places now where people go to learn about life. He said, first they go in there and they learn how to read these things on a piece of paper. These are words, you know, that you, you learn how we do that. Okay, then they learn to write about what they read about. And then they learn to talk about what they write about. And if they read enough and write enough and talk enough, pretty soon they get a piece of paper that says they're a doctor of life. Oh, hey. Oh, hey, he said. He said, then he said, they take the, the, the ones that, that are the best talkers, thinking well, whatever. They put them in these big places all over they have them now to study about life. I'm trying to describe these scientific laboratories. So they have these machines you can look into, things that are small, but look, makes them look big. Look way out in the heavens out there and things that are far away makes them look close. They take and pour Mother Earth back and forth, parts of her back and forth, and they study her and look at her, and they've been doing this for years now. They spent a lot of money. I said, do you know what they found out? The old man got shook his head. They found out that everything's interrelated. They found out when you pollute the water, which all things drink, you pollute all these things. They found that when you pollute the air, all living things breathe. You pollute all living things. The old man kind of looked and he smiled. He says, oh, huh. He said, I was wondering when they get around to that. I was wondering when they get around to that. Look what we're doing. We're cutting our mother hair, mother earth's hair, which shouldn't be cut up. We're taking drilling holes inside of her and sucking her blood. Up. Then we're putting things inside of her and blowing her bones up. And he looked directly in the eyes of my grandfather and said, and what would happen if you did that to your mother? She's, she'll die. So our elders and our prophecies have foretold this challenge for, for, for way before I was born. At the same time, you know, I believe that by coming together and drawing upon this age-old indigenous wisdom that exists uh, still everywhere on Mother Earth, together with the cutting edge uh, technologies that we have, you know, that, by the way, you know, we always used the best technologies available to us. We weren't foolish people as indigenous people. The thing is, tools depend on the values the spiritual foundation of the person using the tools. And the problem is today, there's been a disconnect, just like in the US Constitution, when they took from the peacemaker, uh, the, the Constitution of the Iroquois and left out women and left out spirit. And so when you leave out the spiritual dimension of this, you miss the foundation of what has to happen. And so, uh, so coming together, Really, we began looking at this back in 1982 when we began to build these 16 principles for building a sustainable, harmonious world. Anyway, we, through the development of these principles, guiding principles, it gave us a foundation of unity. 
and I won't go further. You can read about those in the, the, the uh, wonderful thing that Anna Luce has put together and background of everyone. And then uh, I had the opportunity because I had been really focused on healing and education and residential school issues and many other things. And I really wasn't uh, involved as much, so much as the uh, Tom Goldtooth. We have some tremendous relatives out there that have been at this on the, on the, on the environmental dimension of this for so long, you know, uh, Toshka, Ruben, George, so many that have been at this for such a long time. But I had this wonderful opportunity to meet, and I'm, I'm going to kind of tell this little story and then lead into uh, uh, Brother Wex Weiler, because I think I, I have a lot to learn. And it'll be really interesting to see what Brother is going to have to say about this time. We talked about the same subject about three months ago when I, I just felt I knew that I felt we'd gone into this runaway climate change. And so we'll see if he's, but what happened was I was invited to a dinner at a, at a wonderful sister, Vandy Savage's home, who was another kind of unsung heroine of this movement. And Tara Stafford, John Cooksey, uh, Ben West, all these wonderful relatives were there. <clears throat> and they asked, you know, we've been trying to, to do something about this Kinder Morgan pipeline, but we, we go out in the water and they arrest us and so forth. We can't quite seem to connect with their, in, in, the indigenous people here, the First Nations people here. Can you give us a hand? And I said, well, you know, <clears throat> I also, as yourselves, uh, am, am an honored guest here. Uh, I'm a, here on this sacred land. That's why I always acknowledge that here we are, sitting right where I am on the unshredded, unseated land of the uh, Salish Nation. And so, um, we, I said, well, I said, I'll tell you what, on two conditions, I'll be willing to go to, uh, Sundance chief, uh, uh, Reuben George. I said, first of all, you're going to have to, to, to come and participate in, in, in prayers and ceremonies because they'll want to know who you are because a lot of times they've gotten into relationships that don't respect our community participation process or community decision-making process, it might be too slow for others. So you have to be able to come. And so they did, they agreed to that. The second thing was you're gonna to have to allow the indigenous peoples here uh, on this land, the First Nations, the Salish First Nations or whoever you are to lead this. They have the opportunity, we have unsurrendered unceded lands here, but also that we have unique rights of, uh, of prior free prior informed consent. And so sure enough, we had just within two days, we had this dinner and through the great leadership, the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, uh, Squamish Nation, uh, Musqueam Nation, so many nations and all the different environmental groups coming in behind and, 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 and supporting the indigenous people here that finally, it looks very clear, that one of the, one of the uh, it looks very clear that this pipeline is dead. Just like the Kinder Morgan uh, has now left and now the government of Canada is with it, but it seems like that stopped. And, and the KXL is stopped as well. So <clears throat> behind this whole thing, this is his dear brother, Rex Weiler, who um, was a co-founder of Greenpeace. And he has been such a mentor of mine in terms of helping me understand uh, what's happening environmentally in the world. And together, uh, really, he, was his, 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 he did uh, you know, most all the work. I just kind of put it in some, some indigenous perspective and, and, and edited it. But we put out this, this, this document, The Critical State of Mother Earth. At that time, we mentioned about runaway climate change. It was released on the 6th of December, 2015, at the, the uh, uh, COP21 at Paris, the climate, Paris, uh, climate Change Accord meetings. And it was very clear. It was supported by many relatives. It's there for you to read. And um, really, it's this comprehensive treaty. And I don't think we need to get into it any further uh, and lose. People can read it. Unless you want to flash real quick those, those four slides and just say, when you get a chance, we ask you to please, I ask you to please read this, read through this. It was signed on, on Mother Earth Day, uh, April 22nd, 
2016 at the, at, in New York at the same time as the nation states of the world were studying the Paris Climate Change Accord. And I appreciate the fact that many countries came together, you know, now it seems like some aren't, but the, at least they came together and agreed there's such a thing as climate change. And just, just one last thing on that, because um, I think it's important. I don't think this is an either or situation. I believe the reason why this thing is so, so difficult to get a hold of is because two things are happening. One, we as a human family in, our, in, our, in, this, in this, this incredible education we're having to have about the reality of what uh, wanting to acquire material things beyond all else, um, you know, that certainly is, 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 is happening. But at the same time, I think there's a natural process that have, that have come together. So we have both a natural cycle and a, man, a human made cycle and they're coming together and accelerate, accelerating together. So it's not either or. I think from my perspective, it's both of them are happening at the same time and that's what is making this move so quickly. And so having said that, I really am honored to introduce good brother Rex Weiler. And brother, looking forward to your take on this. Uh, brother Phil, thank you so much. Uh, Sister Annalois, uh, thank you so much for organizing this. Uh, I see so many wonderful people here and thank you all for giving your time to this uh, absolutely critical discussion that we as a human family uh, must have. Um, Brother Phil was being a bit modest um, about his partic you know, my role in this and his role. Uh, Brother Phil has helped most of us, many of us in the environmental movement, learn to think the right way, to think as one human family, uh, and to understand not only as one human family, but as one living family uh, with all of our relatives um, on this earth, with whom we share this earth. Uh, and that has helped us see our environmental crisis in, in a more complete way. Uh, let me say one thing about um, the climate change challenge. Uh, you've mentioned the biodiversity. We also saw on the list on that list the boundaries. We saw the nutrient cycles. Uh, I'll explain briefly about nutrient cycles. Because of human waste, when we every living thing needs nitrogen. Nitrogen is a nutrient for all living things. Every time we eat dinner, breakfast, lunch, a snack, we are concentrating nitrogen in our bodies, and the waste that comes from our homes in our septic and, and down our sinks all contains these nit nitrogen nutrients. Um, what we are doing is concentrating the nutrients through the human community, loading them into rivers and lakes. Uh, we're causing uh, algae blooms in the lakes and rivers and causing dead zones in the ocean and so forth. That's what that nutrient cycle business is all about. It's just as urgent as climate change, just as urgent as our biodiversity collapse. All of these issues that we are looking at, these environmental issues, they are symptoms. They are symptoms of a larger issue. And that issue in ecology, we call that overshoot. I'll give you an example of overshoot. Overshoot is when a species the success, a successful species overshoots its habitat. This doesn't just happen with humans. If a, if a pack of wolves, a family of wolves occupies a new watershed with lots of deer and lots of rabbits to eat, those wolves will grow and grow and grow in numbers until they've overshot that habitat, until they've eaten too many deer and rabbits. And what happens to those wolves? They start to die back. Nature has a way of dealing with this. When wolves overshoot their watershed and die back, we think that's just normal. And it is, oh that's goodness. the way nature works. But we have this strange idea that humans somehow get a free pass. Oh, you, you saw those pictures, you saw those graphics, that Anna Lois uh, put, uh, put up about humans and our livestock. Do you know now that humans and our livestock represent 96% of the, 
of the mammal biomass on Earth. That includes all the whales, all the elephants, all the raccoons and rats, all the mammal biomass on Earth. 4% is wild, 96% are humans and our livestock. This is overshoot. We have overshot the habitat of the entire earth. And we have to understand that nature has a way of dealing with this. There will be a, a contraction of the human enterprise all over the earth. Now, one thing about climate change, we've had 30 years of climate meetings the science has been known for over a hundred years. We have had 30 years of science, scientifically based climate meetings to, to resolve the question of climate change. Through those entire 30 years, the emis human emissions of carbon has continued to increase, not decrease. How can you have 30 meetings about a problem and the problem gets worse? something is fundamentally wrong with our human system. And that fundamental thing that is wrong with our human system, I think Anna-Louise mentioned, is our economic system, which is designed around profit. That the rich can invest their money and make more money. That, in a nutshell, is our economic system and it is killing our planet. So, what can we do? The question I believe we all care about most, what can we do? And I have a few suggestions. I think we, it's already been mentioned, but we must learn to live more simply. Hoarding and collecting material things, being richer, having more cars and bigger houses, this is not the path to paradise. The path to paradise is to learn to live simply, consume as little as possible, mm -hmm. and we as a human family also have to learn uh, to stabilize our growth as a human family, which means smaller families, uh, taking more time uh, before we have children, uh, considering the impact of our size of our human family on the earth. One of the things that I think is important for everyone to do, if you want to do something, is to simply stay active. And I don't think it so much matters how you choose to stay active. Stay active on the things that you love to do. Stay active on the, on the actions that, that you feel comfortable with and where you feel you can have an effect. But just simply being active gives you a sense of peace and calm because you know that you are helping. Secondly, we have to localize our efforts. We have to focus on family and community and the ecosystem where we live. I do not believe that there are any giant global solutions to any of this. The giant global uh, political meetings that we've had are not working. Please, I encourage people so much to focus where you live on your community. Every once in a while, you will have an opportunity to help on a larger scale. Let those opportunities come. Otherwise, focus where you live on your, with your families, with your community, build community cohesion and protect your local ecosystems. The third thing I would I suggest is be in love with nature and express that love every day go for a walk, spend time with Mother Earth. Not just talking about it, not just thinking about it, spend time in the arms of Mother Earth. And she will guide you, she will, I promise you, I know this for a fact. But you have to give the time. And finally, there's a Buddhist concept. It's called sharpening the sword. Now we may think the sword, that seems like an an aggressive tool. But here's what the Buddhists mean by sharpening the sword. You are the sword that needs to be sharpened. Work on yourself. Make yourself a better person. Help yourself learn more to understand others, to give space for others. 
make your help lose your help yourself lose your own ego and your own desire to gain power or strength or notoriety as you become a better human being as you become more graceful and more modest and more humble you become a, a more effective agent of change that's what the buddhists mean when they say sharpen the sword you are the sword keep that sword sharp mindful caring of others it's very important in my experience in the I've, I've been in the environmental movement and social justice movements my entire adult life since i was a teenager for over 60 years and i can tell you the weakest link is always our own ego so those are some suggestions for me i know that many of you are working already uh, to try to make this world a better place it is going to take the entire human family, and I, I thank you so much for giving me a few moments uh, to talk to you uh, about these challenges that we face. And I look forward for the rest of the, the morning hearing what, what the rest of you have to say. Thank you so much. Thank, All thank my relations. You. Ho, ho, hey. Thank you so much, brother. I really, really deeply appreciate it. I want to share also that, that uh, Lila June, uh, Toja Lila June, will be here. She's having a little breakfast with her grandmother. So uh, I think we should go ahead and move forward the agenda uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll include her in when she arrives. There's a new leadership consciousness that is required. And that uh, it really, you know, we've, if we are looking also at, we've had the Human Rights Charter, there's been a lot of emphasis on our rights, but very little emphasis on our responsibility. Yeah, of course, we have also the Earth Charter, which emphasis uh, is more on our collective responsibility. But it is really essential that we are starting to come in this, to understand our collective responsibility also as a collective leadership responsibility, collective leadership opportunity. And this is where we can see as well that there is um, a, a beautiful movement being born in this process. And it's the rise also of the feminine wisdom and the feminine qualities. And, and I'm uh, for a purpose talking about as feminine qualities and not just only women <laughs> because I see this also within the man not just in the woman yeah and so as we are seeing the kind of planetary consciousness rising the planetary consciousness waking up uh, uh, mother Earth speaking via us we are her we are her children the Gaia consciousness uh, awakening we seeing at the same time of course also the feminine qualities and feminine values uh, in terms of that inclusiveness uh, of our diversity uh, and our relatedness perspective and, and really caring and honoring also the future generations and uh, including the seventh generation in all of our decision making, which we haven't done. So I'd like to briefly share it uh, as well. We, you know, Rex mentioned, of course, already about the economic system, which is very important, but also let us understand our democratic systems now some of my background uh, is not only in ecology and in leadership development but it's when i first started it was actually in constitutional and in international law and uh, what i noticed if we are looking at our democratic systems there's a flaw in that and that they are by design not sustainable because having a four-year electoral cycle continuously means that the seven generations and the seventh generation isn't including in our decision making processes and that um, you know very often we have a discontinuity as well so this is really uh, you know it's such a deep call for all of us as a humanity to redesign uh, our societies on the basis of very different principles and this is where also the 16 guiding principles that brother phil shared with you and that you can read up as well through the resources provide a very very powerful framework as well as the 16 articles in the international treaty for protecting mother earth and so this is um, you know really wonderful to build on that and we need therefore also new and different consultation processes because as long as we have these electoral systems and political systems whereby um, it's 50% and often it is not even in realistically 50% deciding for the other 50% that is not going to work yeah? and this is why we need new and different forms of decision making as well and what we can see in the rise of the feminine qualities and understanding um, is it's precisely these values and yeah? is that inclusiveness um, to really see ourselves as a united family 
and that is of course a lot of work for us to be done <laughs> because that means now how do we create processes also for that deep form of collaboration and how do we create processes for that inclusiveness of our diversity and and that may and we come from systems mechanistic systems that have been breeding so much division uh, as um, Brother Phil very often says that uh, this unity is the disease <laughs> of community so that we have to really um, you know address that and again the 16 guiding principles are a very powerful framework for healing that disease of disunity uh, and to come into unity um, in a very inclusive manner because we've seen a lot of movements around unification as well but very often the ones that speak for the unity become the next dominator and this is again what we need to be incredibly aware of um, so we need new structures new forms of governance new principles and i'd like to share with you also therefore uh, some legal frameworks that are useful for all of us to work with and i i really wish that every um, child who goes to school and high school learns about law. <laughs> it's amazing that many people don't know the law and the constitution, so we don't know how to leverage it. And uh, it's a very powerful framework because in the, in the legal movement, for example, the, the, the conversation about five, 10 years ago was, do we need new laws in order to protect our climate and mother earth? And then what you can see in some movements from the Netherlands and other places, they said, well, hold on. Let's look at our existing constitution and isn't there in the existing constitution a responsibility of the government to protect its citizens from foreseeable harm. Now that clause in the constitution was often used as a um, kind of a, a, a vote to say if we need to go to war <laughs> in order to protect our boundaries, uh, so if we need to protect our citizens from foreseeable harm, then we can do that. And exactly in the climate um, change, lawyers have actually used this clause in a very different way to say that governments therefore have the responsibility to protect their citizens from foreseeable harm. And that means that if governments are now not reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, are not doing something about the biodiversity loss, are not changing their economic systems, are not implementing uh, the climate, the Paris Agreement Accord, uh, are not radically reducing um, yeah, our carbon footprint and ecological footprint. That means that we are, that, and then governments can be held responsible for exposing their citizens to foreseeable harm. And the Uganda case, for example, in the Netherlands is a very powerful case. And it has shown that uh, citizens took the government to court and won the case. Yeah? And that they did not need to create new treaties or new laws, but they could use the existing law and existing frameworks. Now, and the reason why I always say, learn about your laws in whatever country you are, because you find leverage points there for holding your government also responsible and accountable. Yeah. And, um, and this is important uh, because quite often people who are kind of abusing power, and I'm not saying governments are doing that, but as a general principle, the ones who are kind of abusing the power and abusing the authority will do so by keeping people ignorant of their power. <laughs> so the power that we have as people and the power that we have as informed people, conscious people, and now united people, also in consciousness, in heart, in mind, in actions and in hands, is phenomenal. And we've only started to tap into that. It's really for us to discover that power that we have as the people <laughs> together, informed, conscious, <laughs> and as Brother Phil often says, informed consent as well, uh, so it's now time that we start to learn to really, really practice these principles. And the indigenous wisdoms have been practicing that and the wisdom keepers for a very long time. So this is where this process of indigenous consultation, indigenous election, um, the indigenous process of uh, democracy as well, which is far more inclusive than the Western models, provides us with very, very powerful foundations for this uh, time. Um, Brother Phil, briefly, would you like to respond to this before you give the mm -hmm, talking stick further? Well, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful for this update from Brother Rex and yourself. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, I really look forward I, now for people to take a look at all these 16 articles of this international treaty that was signed by Indigenous 
uh, representatives across the Americas and Indonesia. Uh, this was brought together uh, through uh, an alliance that has developed in our, and, and is developing. There's this great alliance of indigenous people now around the world that are uh, coming together to, to work with these as well. Other people, I, I think one of the most significant things I saw happen at the World Parliament of Religions, it's a thing that ha had a special meaning to me because I've, I've seen uh, in, in my journey, when I first went to Europe in, in 1962, I think it was, I was 18 years old, and traveled for a year there just to see that dimension of things. And as well, uh, have had a deep relationship uh, with the Netherlands since I was just a young boy, I think I was nine years old, and they had the big flood there in Rotterdam. And my dad uh, has this tradition of Wakpala, who, who were doing it after they had nothing. We wanted to send all my toys and things there and made a deep relationship there. So I think that, that what, uh, what I'm seeing happen is this whole, and you've been such a great part, you know, Sister Karen and, and uh, so many others have, uh, have been slowly but surely developing in this, and that is the sacred circle of the indigenous women of Europe. And I think that awakening and reconnecting, uh, and I saw the reception uh, of, of, of the, the sisters, uh, this dele beautiful delegation and this beautiful young granddaughter who came with them. I saw the reception when they were standing in their strength uh, from standing and knowing where they came from and wanting to know where they came from and as well learning from others. I saw the response from the uh, indigenous women there and, and I saw the response, not only indigenous women from the Americas, but indigenous women from Africa. They embraced that because they felt they were coming together now to really talk about how all of us, each and every one of us, has gone through this, this, this colonization process really since, since almost the beginning of time. And so now is the time, and I think this, this really in the long run, this is gonna be a strange, in the long run, these challenges of, of climate change, how so beautifully shared by, by Brother Rex in terms of you know, we just simply are have destroying our habitat, just like wolves when they overhunt. And I think that that without this, this, um, uh, uh, you know, ch challenge, this challenge, I don't think that the human family uh, would would probably be. They would be looking inside and beginning to understand how we have to come together. And I'm sorry that that's the way it seems it has to be, but that's what appears that's happening. So I just want to thank everybody so far. I just want to listen some more. I know we have uh, some wonderful uh, presentations, and I'll let you know when, when uh, I let you. Th thanks very much, brothers. So I'd love to ask Connie Baxter-Marlow and um, Andrew Cameron Bailey if they could share with us a little bit about their perspective and add their voices of wisdom to their con this conversation. Hello, everybody. Hello there. So, Hello. <laughs> uh, be here with many of you we don't know, and many of you we've seen recently at, in Toronto at the Convergence and at the Parliament of World Religions. We've seen you at Tribalize. Uh, we're aware of others of you. Yes, and we only have a very few minutes. So I'll bring a little bit of what my vision and knowing is, and then Andrew will bring some uh, concrete solutions that he's come up with. But from my perspective, and I'll echo what Phil just said, and that is that this climate crisis is, is a crisis that's breaking the heart open. The love of Mother Earth is catalyzing us into our hearts and into our love for all of creation. And to me, that's the purpose of this climate change. And the only way out is up. Different frequencies have different laws, and that this this game that's based on scarcity thinking, old thinking, old understanding of the nature of the universe is erroneous and has us in a low frequency. And the only way out is to move to a higher frequency where all the SDGs of the UN, everything everyone ever desired are given. We just can't get there from here given our core assumptions about the nature of the universe, how the universe actually works. And I've spent extensive time with visionary elders, including uh, Brother Phil here many, many years ago, and many others who've come into my life to show me 
these missing pieces of our paradigm that we are operating on erroneous assumptions about the nature of the universe that keep us stuck in a lower frequency. And fixing the problems in the lower frequency to me is not what it's about. It's about going inside, connecting with our hearts, connecting with our brothers and sisters, of our, um, am, am I still there? Yeah. Um, you know, the all of creation that, that the indigenous peoples have lived and known forever. And, and now it, our hearts are opening and our minds are opening to the indigenous people because they're the caretakers of the earth. And we're in a crisis of the earth. It's our love of the earth that's just saying to, hey, indigenous people, what have you got to bring to this party? And the, the 16 principles uh, of, of Brother Phil's are brilliant. Now we just have to move into living them. And the, the treaty that they've done, I mean, there's just so been so much concrete work done by your people, by the uh, Phil and you, uh, Analos, and everyone who's gotten this far. And I think we, I just, we just have something to bring to this party. And that is that we need to go to our core assumptions about the nature of the universe. How does it work? And what we're bringing is that there is, in fact, only love. And so we, it's a whole construct that we're bringing on the nature of the universe that resolves many of the paradoxes that has us see things as not love, that keep us from walking into our hearts and aligning with our intuition, watching the signs of the universe, telling us what to do. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm just kind of jamming in a whole bunch of thoughts into a very short period of time. Party going on. We're all invited. We're just not there. And that party is more abundance than we can fathom, more joy, beauty, balance, the true human nature, the true human heart coming to play. All of creation is awaiting the love in the human heart. And the climate crisis is catalyzing that opening of the heart. Thank you. How do we wake up? Then we have to grow up. People have the epiphanies and so on, and still do not know how to behave as an adult human being. In fact, our species behaves much like a, an adolescent, especially the country of my uh, relocation to the United States is truly adolescent in its current behavior. And there's serious danger in that. So we are a very endangered species right now. Honestly, this is the most dangerous time I'm aware of in all of human history. That's a big deal. It's Climate change is a well, climate, the climate threat is an enormous challenge and there are many, many others, as I know you know. So climate, the climate challenge. I no longer use the term climate change. I no longer use the term global warming. I use the term climate restoration because the fact is that we can wake up, grow up, show up, Put clean up, up. <laughs> clean up, put our boots on, clean up is a big part of it, and restore the climate to the state it was in before the Industrial Revolution. Now that sounds crazy, that was 300 years ago. I was born in England and it was my people who introduced the Industrial Revolution to the rest of the world. And now we're seeing the, the unintended consequences of that. So purely in, in, on the um, the venture or the, uh, the challenge of restoring climate, what do we do? Well, let's look at the problem. The problem appears to be a trillion tons of excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Back in our great grandfather, great great grandfather's day, the, we had about 300 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Right now we are running about 410 and that's at the top of Mauna Loa in Hawaii where the air is exceedingly pure. If you're in somewhere like New Delhi or Cairo, you're probably in the region of 450 to even 600 parts per million. And at that point, you're in trouble. And these incredibly polluted cities that have resulted from the burning, mostly from the burning of fossil fuel, have put us in a situation. And the situation is dire. As Rex said earlier on, we've known about it for a hundred years. Even Ronald Reagan, that marvelous um, American president, even Mr. Reagan, said we have to do something about climate change. Now we have a president, if I may call him such, who uh, doesn't seem to believe that. In fact, he's moving as fast as he can in the opposite direction. 
to me, that's almost like a declaration of war, a climate war on my grandchildren. I take that personally. So I'm working for four little people, none of whom is over the age of 10. My training was as a chemical engineer and looking at too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's a chemistry question. It's a chemical engineering question. And the chemistry in the solution, and I'm going to speak about solutions. I have, as a chemical engineer, I've been attending conferences, looking for solutions, not seeing them, and realizing that I had better wake up and show up and see if I I moved I to the U.S. from South Africa, where I grew up back in 1969, and over here, I became a designer builder. And currently, I'm designing and building a system that extracts CO2 from the atmosphere and provides multiple benefits to the community within which it is installed, this, this building. Here's the building. That's one view of it. Here's a cross section. Can you all see it? Hopefully. And we start with agriculture. We have an agricultural, a regenerative agriculture component that literally eliminates Monsanto, eliminates chemical agri agriculture in its totality. And this is based on a, an American invention patented back in the mid 90s that literally hits the reset button on agriculture. Forward to collaborating and conversing with any of you who would like to be in touch. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for this wonderful um, inspiration as well. <laughs> a transition to go to our dear friends, uh, Dr. Daniel Wolf. This has been really rich already, um, and um, I want to keep it brief. Uh, Annalise invited me to speak a little bit about the rising regeneration movement around the world, or what I call the regeneration rising. I think that all of us alive today are challenged in our lifetimes to redesign the human impact on earth, to fundamentally change our ways to um, become healers of a wounded planet that, that we wounded, and um, to do what we can to turn this runaway climate change around before, before it turns into cataclysmic climate change. And the good news is that this is happening all over the world. And um, one of the core principles of regenerative development is it starts with personal development. So I'm going to echo a lot of what has already been said. Rec um, mentioned a, a lot of wonderful things um, that um, stay active. Like we, by the power of our attention and the power of our intention, we shape this world. There's nothing that we cannot, like that we do or don't do, that doesn't affect the whole that we're a part of. So just a loving attention towards trying to be part of the healing rather than part of the destruction of Mother Earth is already making a difference. And so it is an internal, it is a spiritual path, it is a personal development path, but it's also a very practical path out there. And um, uh, for example, Paul Hawkins' project Drawdown has listed a hundred ways that we can draw carbon out of the atmosphere already right now. Um, there is a global movement on regenerative agriculture that is changing how we grow our food in ways that farmers become guardians of ecosystems' health. And there's a global, more academic and policy-driven movement around planetary health. I wrote my PhD in 2006 on design for human and planetary health and was really surprised when, because initially nobody wanted to know about it. And in 2017, the Rockefeller Foundation and The Lancet, the key medical journal, published a report on planetary health. And for all of you out there, this could be just like the SDGs with all their flaws, uh, an invitation and a platform for a conversation we need to have right now, also about their flaws. In a similar way, this planetary health concept, which is already 120 universities and government policy think tanks lined up around the planet, is a key entry point for us to work on all of this. I, I see a confluence on the planet. As we see the converging crises of Fritjof Kapra, my mentor, said, if you follow the ecological, the economic, and the social crisis upstream, you meet a crisis of consciousness, a crisis of perception. In a similar way, if you, as, as the crises are converging, the solutions and those trying to heal the planet are 
converging and confluencing, like, like rivers meeting. And for me, these are the rivers of planetary health, of everything regeneration. We've mentioned the fundamental need to redesign our economic system. It is a degenerative and dysfunctional system, and there are people working on that. The Capital Institute has published a paper on what would regenerative capitalism or regenerative economy look like. Just a couple of days ago, they've published a paper of how what would regenerative finance look like. Um, then there are people like the, the Regen Network um, working on new technologies that, that um, provide the proof of regeneration of ecosystems so people can invest in regeneration of ecosystems. And there's a lot of wonderful work going on in education, the Earthwise Center, Gaia Education, Gaia University, the permaculture movement, um, the holistic land management movement, so many people coming together. Um, there's deep wisdom in the, the regenerative development process developed by Regenesis Group and um, I'm really excited to see all these things coming together. And for those who are interested, I gave a talk on this at Findhorn. I'll, I'll post the link um, on this so you just get all the links. Um, yeah, so somebody said earlier, well, I, I loved how Brother Phil described how after all these years of science, we finally figured out that it's all connected and it's all interrelated and it's all intelligent. Um, this is the strapline of, of pioneers who've, who've done good work in trying to bridge this gap between indigenous knowledge and modern science and innovative um, explorational ecological designers and engineers for decades now. And so our movement is not a new movement. Our movement is a movement that is as old as the climate change problem and actually an ancient movement if we finally reconnect with the wisdom that indigenous cultures have to share to us. And as we stand up and do something about this, we do so with the power and authority of 3.8 billion years of life's evolution. It is life speaking through us saying enough. We have done enough damage. We now need to make a difference. And we now, and this is, it, it is local, but it is global. It is both local and global because we need to do the action in our place, in our bioregion, bio but we also need to keep connected to learn from each other and to keep this awareness that everything we do everywhere is contributing to the healing of the planet. And as we come together in all our diversity with all our strife and current fundamentalism of beliefs, we will heal ourselves as we heal our ecosystem and our planet. We are a wounded people, a wounded civilization. We're not even a civilization worthy that name. There's too many things to go on in the name of humanity that are uncivilized for us to call ourselves civilization. Let's become a civilization and let's do so by healing the planet and healing ourselves. Thank you. Oh, hey. And you know, uh, uh, dear, uh, Kojalala June Johnson just came and arrived from this beautiful breakfast she had with her grandmother. And so uh, Tojalala June is just a, for me, uh, one of the fulfillment of the sacred prophecies about the rising of our seventh generation. And I'm fully with you in terms of the idea of, of let's have this go on forever, not just limited, but right at this time of history, I mean, her, her, uh, love and kindness and compassion for indigenous people, but for all members of the human family. I saw her in action in Ethiopia. She has this incredible, beautiful heart. She's, she, she's so honest. She's so very brilliant, ha having graduated our Stanford University with a very, very high honors. And yet she is the most humble, loving, straightforward, but truthful young person. Uh, there's many, many uh, reflecting her, but she's she has got a special message. So uh, Toja, we've got time here. Please share your message. Thank you so much, Dekshi. Um Yeah, at Eshik Eyaro Shudin Esh E um Lila Junior Nish Ye Nanish Ejit Hachin in a Slindle Haskaitan Eb Bashishi Ashin Hedishiche Bilagana Eda Shinelle. Uh, Taos, New Mexico, Dayton, I shan't. But it did last in the shirrun. I quit ego, then I asked on the shling. 
Um, my name's Lila June. Uh, I'm a I'm a friend uh, and a and a niece and a granddaughter to uh, Chief Phil Lane here. Um, I'm really honored to be a part of this group here. Um, I'm from the Black Charcoal Streak uh, division of the Red Streak in the Water Clan of the Diné Nation, um, also sometimes incorrectly known as Navajo. Um, and um, on this discussion about runaway climate change, um, I think what I wanted to uh, present uh, as an idea is the idea of uh, my, my people's creation story. Um, we have a, a very ancient creation story where we talk about um, the four worlds. And in this uh, creation story, humanity moves, moves through uh, a series of worlds and each world is destroyed and a new world begins. And um, each time that a world is starting to come to an end, the people have to evolve or um, die pretty much. Um, and so some of the people make it through to the next world because they uh, undergo a process of, you know, quote unquote evolution. Um, and so the first world was flooded uh, and you'll find a lot of different uh, nations around the world say that, you know, they remember the flood a great, great, great flood that flooded the earth. It's not just the Bible that talks about that. Every nation I've ever come across talks about the flood. So um, my understanding is that this uh, oral history is not just a myth, a myth, but rather is a, a, cr a chronicle of uh, remembered history and herstory um, of the people. And so they said at one point, the fourth, the fourth world, which is the current world that we are in, would also end. And, um, and that we would be forced to evolve or die. Uh, we would be forced to evolve or die. And in that fourth, at the end of that fourth world, we would enter into the, uh, the fifth world, which was the, uh, the glittering world. I'm not sure why they call it the glittering world, but that's what they called it. So um, while, while I am not happy about the um, destruction of, you know, a large percentage of the species of the earth, and while I am not happy uh, at, uh, about the destruction of uh, Mother Earth and, and of women as well, as they are kind of mirrors of each other, um, I did. Um, I do know that my people have seen this coming for a long time. Uh, we kind of understood that this was going to happen, um, and we've actually been through many uh, worlds before. We've we've seen the destruction of worlds before, and so um, this this history uh, is all about um, uh, learn learning hard lessons and learning them the hard way. Sadly. Uh, and this relates to um, the the understanding of our ancient societies. You know, I I did graduate from Stanford with honors, and I studied anthropology, and I studied a, a native education for my master's, and I've just started my PhD on uh, indigenous food systems. And all this time, you know, they talk about how. Um, Oh, the Chaco Canyon, you know, uh, and the Mayan ruins and all these, uh, you know, these Western art anthropologists would talk about, oh, you know, these um, important Indian uh, cities that were vacated. And people always wonder, why did, the, why did they leave the city? Why did they leave the city? And Chaco Canyon is very much revered here in New Mexico, where I am now. It's very much a... Um, uh, a, a, a prized archaeological site and people travel from all over the world to see it. What people do not understand is that Chaco Canyon is a place where we went wrong. Um, we developed a caste system there 
we developed a form of slavery. Uh, we developed uh, a system where certain peoples were subservient to others. Uh, we, we developed running water there. Uh, we also developed, um, we developed um, uh, exhaustion of the soil and the resources of the land. Um, and they say that creator sent a drought to the people of Chaco Canyon to give them the courage to change. Because what we were doing at Chaco Canyon was not in alignment with creator's uh, plan, creator's design. And, 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 and untruth can only last so long on land as sacred as this. And so um, uh, over time, the people uh, had to leave and they had to vacate the, the area. Um, and they, they learned a lot of hard, hard, hard lessons. So sometimes I say, you know, as a Native American woman, you know, we weren't just born this cool, you know, we weren't just born this awesome, uh, just kind of a joke, but, you know, we actually had to go through a lot of hard lessons to become the nations that we are and to become the, uh, um, the people that we are, uh, and, and people greatly misunderstand the origins of slavery. It started here. It started here on Turtle Island, or as some people call it, um, um, America. It started here. And so um, we've been through it. We've been around the block. We know what to do. We know what not to do. Um, we're very sophisticated in our ecological sciences. We have songs that can heal cancer that doctors don't even know how to heal. We're very, very sophisticated uh, cultures. We have been brought to our knees pretty bad by 500 years of terrorism, but even with that, we're, we're, we still retain a lot of our sophistication. Uh, a lot of it has been, um, has been destroyed, but we do retain the, the core of it, thank goodness. Um, but anyways, so, these uh these cities uh the mayan civilization why did they leave everyone's wondering why did they leave well the mayans as well uh started to develop um they started to play god you know started to play god and 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 create the world around them instead of allowing themselves to meld into the creation that already existed around them kind of like new york city is a way that we play God, you know, we, we think we can build a better environment than creator can. And we just, we just never will be able to, that's not our role. That's not our place here. Um, and so, um, the, the Mayans actually left that city because they decided that they were not God. And my elders say, can you imagine the faith it would take to leave the city and go into the forest again and to be humble? child of of creation once again uh, and so these were times when our societies deviated from truth and we paid for it every single time not in a, not as a punishment but just it's kind of like trying to plant a tree in the river it just it's just not going to work you have to plant it in soil um it, it's not punishing the seed for not growing in a river it's just not how it's designed to grow so we are in the process of altering our um, practice, our way of living, such that we uh, make more sense. In other words, we're planting the seed of humanity in the soil instead of in the water. So all of this uh, climate change, you know, they say there's a, the people get cancer, you know, people get cancer and, and a lot of people you see those billboards that say, we fight cancer and we're gonna beat cancer, we're gonna kill cancer. But from my elders perspective, um, cancer is actually a messenger. And cancer is, uh, in a way, it's like that drought that came to the people of Chaco Canyon and gave them the courage to change. The cancer is like a catastrophe and it's a messenger saying, hey, something is not um, in balance in your life maybe you blamed yourself for a way that someone abused you when you were little, um, something that wasn't your fault. And so um, the cancer is helping us get back to health. 
And so similarly, uh, this climate change is, is, is like cancer. It's, it's saying, hey, it's a messenger saying, hey, this is not, this is not in harmony. This is not in balance. This is not like, what if there was no climate change and we just kept skewing off in this direction? You know, we would just get more and more uh, distanced from our true nature. In a way, I see climate change as a great balancer, a great reminder from Mother Earth telling us um, it's time to bring, uh, bring yourselves back as, as children of nature, not masters of nature. So the moral of the story is, uh, do not break what creator has made. Because we are breaking what creator has made all over creation, uh, there, there are consequences. It's very simple. For instance, uh, oil is sacred and it's meant to be where it, where it is. Everything has a purpose. And if it's underground, it's because it has a purpose underground. If you take it out of the ground, there will be consequences. Same with coal, same with uranium, same with silver, same with gold. Every single one of those mines has a dark consequence. Um, dams, damming the river. That's another example of breaking creation. You know, the river, if it doesn't have a dam in it, it's probably not supposed to have a dam in it. So these people, they build dams and they don't understand that there's fish that have to go up and down. There's nutrients that have to go downstream. And they just basically uh, destroy an entire ecosystem. And they said that we were primitive. And we say, wow, well, are we the ones that are primitive? Because you just block that river. Like, don't you understand there's salmon that have to go up? And don't you understand that those salmon actually keep the whole forest alive and the soil alive? And people don't, for some reason, they don't, they don't click. It's like that river, don't damn the river. That's not a good idea. Um, another example of breaking what creator has made is the GMOs. Again, playing God. We are not God. We are, we are children of God. Uh, here we go, uh, uh, tinkering with the genetics of the seed. So this climate change is a uh, response. It's a consequence to our actions. And if, if, if a child never had any consequences, they would never learn. And so just like my ancestors, um, my elders said, you want to know where the people of Chaco Canyon went? Just look in the mirror. And I said, what do you mean? They said, you are, you, you are the descendant of the people of Chaco Canyon. And I said, oh, yeah. And they said, um, you know, that's where they went. And, and, and just like my ancestors had to learn these hard lessons to be able to give me my language, which has beautiful words in it, like hajoba, humility, kindness, which or eh, which means kinship, mindedness, and 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 equality, or hojon, which means joy inside and out, um, or ayoaninishne, um, which is a way you t you tell someone that you have that you love them and you have a high esteem for them. All of these languages, uh, all of these words in my language that are so sophisticated and so beautiful and, and that tie a human community together in harmony uh, were born out of that struggle, were born out of that caste system. Uh, kind of like when a child touches a hot stove, oof, it burns. And we learn, and we learn words that keep us from getting burned again. We learn words that help us keep each other from that hot stove. And so just as my ancestors had to uh, get burned to learn very hard lessons, which is don't enslave each other. <laughs> uh, don't act like you can do better than nature. I mean, you can try, go ahead, but it's not, you're gonna learn that it's not the way. And so, um, and so just as my ancestors had to learn these things the very, very hard way, all of humanity on a global scale now is learning a very, very, very hard lesson. 
And that lesson is, if you take this mother for granted, you will lose her, you know? And uh, it's hard. It's hard to lose your mother. But once we lose her, as we are losing her now, she's slipping through our fingers. We will learn, <laughs> trust me. We are gonna learn uh, a big lesson, um, a big lesson that is gonna teach us uh, to remember to never ever break what the creator has made. Uh -huh. and, and two, one last thing I'll say is um, to not be a master of nature, but to be a child and to be a part of nature. So that is what my elders uh, taught me. I'm literally just plagiarizing everything they said. I'm not really that wise. I just, I'm just relaying the message to you all. And I thank you all. And I thank you, uh, Dekshi, for letting me be on today. Oh, oh hey. You know, uh, uh, Toja, uh, uh, if, when we come to the last speaker here, and I'm not sure because <laughs> we have, if, then really appreciate it. if you give a little prayer, or song, some words, whatever. That'd be really wonderful to close it out. So uh, I'll leave that and loose. Our, uh, we have uh, more speakers yet? Yes, okay, fine. We have two speakers. I ask those relatives that are here. I realize we're going longer than we expected. Uh, sometimes uh, my, my father said it, a good Indian visit, a good Dakota visit, you come in October and you leave in March. That's a good visit. So <laughs> if we're going a little bit over, then I ask you, if you want to have a good visit, please continue. If you have to leave, we certainly understand. Okay, fine. Thank you so much. And Lila, thank you so much. This was so powerful. Michelle, uh, holiday. I'd love to hear from you very briefly as well. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm, I'm still absorbing this last message as well. So uh, if there's one thing that I would share, it's my focus on thriveability as a story, the story that we're all talking about. This is the word that I use um, to invite us all to focus on life and on the need to align with life to uh, create the fertile conditions for life to thrive at every level for ourselves as individuals, for each other, for our communities, for our organizations as living systems, living ecosystems, for our economies, for the biosphere. So this is the focus of my work, bringing that invitation and that opportunity into organizations and communities as practice grounds. Wherever we come together, we have an opportunity not just for transaction, but for transformation. And this is the urge that life has to connect with other forms of life in order to be transformed, in order to grow and evolve in some way. So uh, I, I go into the most ordinary of organizations and offer that opportunity, that invitation. I was in a hospital this morning and um, helping the nursing managers recognize that in their own words, we're in between paradigms. We're moving from a mechanistic paradigm into a living systems paradigm. And it's a difficult transition, but uh, it's it's a necessary one and the silver lining of all of this global uh, catastrophe is that we're forced out of our complacency. And I've been working in this field and this movement for about 20 years and it's both um, just depressing and I'm in despair and I'm really excited that finally we can be having these conversations and uh, without hesitation. So thank you, Anluz, for bringing us together. I have um, a, a few pages that I'll send you afterwards that are self-explanatory about how we can create uh, practice grounds for aligning with life 
and creating the fertile conditions for for thriving at every level over time for 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 thriveability. So um, I think I'll just leave it at that for now. And uh, and thanks everyone for for being in it, for being in it in it together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. I mean, I love your work. And yes, please uh, share those links <laughs> with everyone later. And that is, that's, that's great. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Kerbans, are you there? <laughs> this silence is very nice. It shows that we are all listening to something trying to at least and it's not easy because we've been so much used to think that we are different and away from each other believers believe non-believers also believe but in different concepts and we've now come to point on our planet that if we don't have planetary consultation, like the sharing that we're doing today, to understand each other better, as well as participative, so that we go back to what we've understood and practice and share more with others, but also inclusive. That is, we cannot exclude the non-believers if we want to have a holistic answer to our problem. And in many Western countries, one has the attitude that believers are majority. And in many non-Western countries, you have a lot of atheist people that don't believe in anything except maybe sometimes in themselves and trying to make what they think is a better life. You have cases that I have faced myself while working <clears throat> in desert land where I've seen migrants that are never spoken of in the Western medias, where people are moving, for instance, from Ethiopia, selling their lands just to try to make more money in Saudi Arabia and dying for that during the war which is taking place there and not being told that there's a war there. And when they get there, they discover what it is. And the funny thing about it is that some of them, you would tell them, okay, dig the hole for your friends who died. They do that and you think that probably they might be thinking, okay, I won't carry on in that direction. I'll go in another direction. No, they do tell you that's their fate. I will die as my own fate. So us as human beings are very difficult learners. Very difficult indeed. And <clears throat> as the sister just said, and this is the case in many primordial tradition around this planet, we talk of several creations. Even in books like the Bible, you might find the trace of these different worlds, talking about the different aspect of creation. And yet, at the end of the day, we remain of flesh and blood and driving spirit, willing it to happen better. I see that every day in my practice, and I also have seen the effect of the climate change, they have been measured. In the States, for instance, it has been measured that there's an increase of about 2% of mental health disease for a one degree forecast over five years that is gonna get worse. And if we look even closer to all the different aspects of mental health, it's not just mental health, it's also an opportunity for change. As our sister just said some time ago, it's an opportunity for us to examine the social 
and physical infrastructure of our communities to consider the opportunities of enhancing a new approach to well-being, the search for new economic structures, basically back again to this idea of a planetary, consultative, participative and inclusive attitude where non-believers and believers can include each other in looking for those answers. The direct side effects that we see in practice is post-traumatic stress disorders, they grow. I wouldn't say like mad, it would sound like a bad joke, but it does. Depression, domestic abuse as well, grows. And of course, the people that are the most at risk are women and kids. And there is a general sense of excite, anxiety. Suicide, suicide ideation, complicated grief, and above all, one of the terrible things, substance abuse. And in the society where this substance abuse grows and grows, and nobody seems to be able to stop it. Now, even our attitude sometimes, we can ask ourselves how much of it is due to this transformation taking place in the environment. Because as you may know, as in Chinese medicines, for instance, you have an intermediate aspect, which is for between each seasons. And now, that this intermediate aspect is growing and growing as if it's becoming more than a season in itself. We are more and more in imbalance because we lack certain nutrients in our body. Therefore, our body doesn't function as before. Irrespective of what you may try to do, we're not eating what we should be eating. And even when we eat the right food, sometimes those foods are poisonous now. We are in a really terrible situation. However, we must cultivate hope. We must carry on the century approaches that has been going on, like inner self-betterment, community involvement. But now there's also a new approach, which is important, which is the legal involvement. Kids have been suing governments and they've won. This is wonderful news. It means that if some people around the world are interested just to see what the kids want for their future and present that in a court of law, we could force some of the governments that don't want to abide to what is necessary for our progress to do so. So that is a great hope. There's of course, strengthen actions of, for social networks, like what we're doing. We're strengthening these links. We're strengthening what we can learn from each other. And here, what may be the new paradigm, or give it birth altogether. Because as they used to say in the past, we're all waiting for an avatar to come. We're not waiting for any outside avatar anymore. We're just trying to give birth to our own inner avatars. So like a co-creation towards this new paradigm. So we need to educate more and more. You have certain places where there are difficult attitudes regarding sexuality. The law is so different from one country to the other. And within the country themselves, they are so different. But the way forward is again, education. That is also part of the problem of climate change because when people are stressed, they become more aggressive and they try to impose more on each other. There's been some old experiments where rats were put in labyrinths and if you were going to have the number of rats making it bigger and bigger, you would have more and more fights. So we end up being at each other's throat. 
And of course, there's this difficult approach whereby people that have never had a fridge in their life want to have a fridge too. They don't understand why the others have got two fridge, four fridges, they got freezers, why they can't have a small fridge. Because you tell them that this is going to create a problem for the planet, they can't understand that. Because they need to have a minimum of comfort. So they believe. So it is necessary really to consider this planetary approach. Have a look at what is happening in other places. Try to see what the media are not telling you. Like what I've just told you, this constant migration which has been going on for centuries between countries where they have great ways of living already, but they will relinquish that just to try to grab some more money by working hard, of course, in other countries around, not going to Europe as what you see in the media. That is just part of it. It's only lately that we've had this great movement towards Europe, but in fact, there's been a lot of movement within these poor countries to what is the richest one in the area. So all over the place, there's this need to improve, not just our inner life, but also have a minimum of comfort. And it might sound strange for someone who is living with two cars to think that somebody else need to have a car as well. The guys never had even a bicycle sometimes. So there's a need for that. There's a need to understand that we cannot have it all just for us. There's a need for a greater brotherhood, sisterhood on the planet. Invent new systems. So please, do get involved in your political systems because they need reshaping from inside. If you don't do it, nobody will do it for it. No one will do it for you. We all have to keep on trying. Thank you so much for all that you shared with us. This will help us improve, I believe, and help others better. Thank you. And I'm going to uh, ask our dear, uh, beloved uh, Toja Lila June to close us off here at this time with a prayer, song, however she wants to do this. And then we'll have the chance to, to reflect on all this incredible wisdom that's been here with us today. I'm so thankful, each and every one of you. Thank you so much. I learned so much, each and every one of you. So, Toja, please uh, take us to that place we need to go beyond the murmur of syllables and sounds. Well, thank you, Dr. Barnes, um, for that beautiful uh, um, insight. I am honored to be with all of you today. Um, okay, so. Um, all right, well, I'll just sing All Nations Rise. How about that, Dexter? Oh, oh, that's beautiful. I love that. I play it all the time, and I cry every time I play it. <laughs> so if I, if I kind of cry a little bit today, that's great. <laughs> all right. Tears Thank are you. good. You're taking us home. Okay. This song is for uh, the indigenous person within all of us that we can all come out and come out of hiding uh, because a lot of forces have belittled our cultures and belittled ourselves, whether you're a Native American or a woman who was persecuted as a witch or um, beautiful African descendant whose culture was ripped away from them or uh, beautiful brother or sister from Asia who were told they were less primitive than, than uh, the Eurocentric states. Um, it's for all of us to, to reclaim our indigenous um, selves. <clears throat> indigenous people, shine your light, we are equal, yeah, yeah. I remember the days when our prayers were illegal. I remember the days when being Indian was lethal. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, we had a rough past, but get ready for the sequel. Get ready for the glorious comeback of our people. Yeah, rise up, all you warriors of love. All you answers to the prayers of our ancestors from above. I can feel it in my heart. Can you feel it in your blood? I can hear the seven fire calling us to wake up. All nations rise, rise up, cause now's your time. We don't have to hide anymore, cause now's our time. All nations rise, rise up, cause now's your time. We don't have to hide anymore cause now's the time with forgiveness as my bow and my prayers as my arrows pull it back and let go i watch them fly like sparrows have hope have hope with compassion as my shield and faith down to my marrow i will walk the pollen path even when it gets narrow yeah yeah resurrect Yes, you can bet that we seen the single mama raising children on the res. We seen domestic violence tear apart what we have left. We've seen the alcohol take it all and leave us dead. We've seen the children take their lives when they can't take the dread anymore. No, we can't take the dread anymore. Oh, no, we won't take the dread anymore. Cause I can't take the dread anymore. Yes, it's a war, but we've seen it all before, and now we know we can change it, because that's why we were born. We know we are the ones that we have been waiting for. Yes, we are the ones that Grandma has been praying for, so rise up, all you warriors of love, all you answers to the prayers of our ancestors from above. I can feel it in my heart. Can you feel it in your blood? I can hear the seventh fire calling us to wake up. All nations rise, rise up, cause now's your time. We don't have to hide anymore, cause now's our time. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Tonka. Great oh, hey. day to be. Ooh, yeah, low. So be it. How? Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you so much, everybody. This is amazing. <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you, uh, Wobi Tonka. Great Thanksgiving for this. And that's um, a low. I really love that, that, that statement. I, I'm, uh, some key words my father passed to me were really important. I mean, so be it. That's the way it shall be. That we shall move forward as we have talked about. Have a great day. And thank you so much. And thank you, Anna Luce, so much, and all that helped out for this to unfold as it is. Oh, we talk to you soon. You're most welcome. Thanks, everybody. Blessings for your day and evening. Goodbye.